Good morning and good year, 2023, to everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the TK Show in 2023. Uh, hoping everybody came into 2023 well and is rested and as always ready for the soap opera that is uh, the Republic of South Africa. And for today's uh, opening, you know, we thought, look, uh, we just had the state of the nation. We're going into the budget talk by the Minister of Finance. And, you know, it's always good just to get different viewpoints and understanding as to where the country is. And most importantly, as we try to emphasize here on the TK show, where the country is going and also in the context of, of the region. So I'd just like to welcome my first guest for the year 2023. Uh, probably one of the most informed uh, people you're likely to hear about and meet in South African politics and also in academia, Mr. Matala Satalokhile from, uh, I think, yeah, Matala, you come from many places. So I think maybe it's best if you can <laughs> just introduce yourself. No, 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 thanks, TK, and thanks, thanks for having me on the show. Um, very much privileged to be your first guest for 2023. Yeah, as you've said, my name is Matlala Sitalokhile, uh, a political scientist by training, uh, specializing in political economy, more focus on political risk analysis, yeah, and public policy. Uh, yeah, is there anything I'm leaving out, TK? And let's never forget the uh, extraordinary uh, consultant. We never forget that part. <laughs> consultant <laughs> the extraordinaire. Yeah, well, look, I've had my fair share in the space. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've been part of uh, seminal government projects in the past, uh, co-developed internationalization strategy for the Small Business uh, Development Department, uh, the Department of Public Service Administrations, work on illicit financial flows. I mean, I, I, I was honored to become a researcher on that. I've done a bit of work for entities in the financial services sector, banking, you know, telecommunications sector, mobile operating uh, networks. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I think I've done quite a bit. Uh, and a few government departments have, 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 have been part of projects that have helped them um, reject uh, their policies. So I've been very privileged that I could, uh, you know, contribute to uh, efforts meant to better our government, make it function uh, more more optimally, if I may say so. Yeah. No, 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 that, that's great stuff, Matel. And it's not, I think that's the type of guests we try to bring on people who don't just, uh, how do you put it, who they don't just philosophize in academia, but they're part and parcel of many of the solutions that are happening in this country. And I think, Matel, it, it's a good way that you kind of encompassed a lot of things. And maybe just the, the first conversation we can just touch on is just your, just your understanding of what is the state of the nation currently of the Republic of South Africa in 2023? Yeah, it's okay. Um, I think it's going to get worse before it gets really worse. Uh, that's the kind of state that we find ourselves in as a country. Uh, look, the challenges that are confronting us as a society, as a nation, are not necessarily new. We've had these challenges for decades now. Uh, the severity is what changes from one year to the other. Uh, the issue of public public service competencies and capabilities is an ongoing issue that has, for instance, contributed to the challenges that we face as a country. Uh, I think the moral fiber of our society is deteriorating as well. Uh, I had the president speak about hope and resilience in the state of the nation address. But I think many South Africans are, be are beginning to lose hope because we identify the same challenges over and over, but we fail to rectify or address them. So the hope that many South Africans has had a few years ago is beginning to, to deplete. And I think that's the, you know, the moral state and not necessarily moral, but uh, how generally South Africans feel currently. But look, amidst all the challenges, I still believe that South Africa has the capabilities uh, to pull itself out of, out of the mess that it finds itself in. Uh, but it will take quite a lot of effort and dedication and political will to steer the country in the right direction. 
No, no, that, that, that's a good overview. Just two points I think which we elaborated on. And I'll, I'll start with the first one, which I think is not really covered a lot. And I think it's good that you said it. Just namely, and especially since you do work on political risk and advice, just the potential of this country, you know, that if you could maybe just elaborate on, because I think you're right in saying, look, there's a... I think we're in Gauteng at the moment and it's, everything is heavy cast and rainy, but there's a gloominess around the country. But just, uh, as you said, there, there is potential in this country. Can you maybe just elaborate on, because I think sometimes in amongst the mess that is our government, we kind of forget that a bit. I think, TK, I'll start firstly with looking at how government has functioned or the public service has functioned in the past almost three decades. Uh, the reality is what we see in the public sector is not necessarily the best that the country can offer. Uh, that skilled South Africans, uh, professionals very capable, uh, that could walk into government uh, and do what is necessary to get the country moving, uh, the public service functioning properly. Obviously, there's issues of organizational culture within public institutions and all of that. It does not mean that capable people can simply just walk in and things miraculously transform. There has also been this kind of cultures that have been embedded in public public institutions that uh, also need to be addressed for skilled and competent people to transform these uh, public institutions. So I think there's a lot of potential in South Africa. Uh, the issue is how that potential has been used by mm -hmm. the powers that be. Uh, is it a matter, it's a matter of have those with potential and capabilities been given opportunities? Uh, I, you know, there's the sentiment that a lot of people, especially those who are seen to be capable, competent, possess a certain level of skill that see government as a place that they do not want to find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And I do not necessarily think that is the case. I think there's many young capable people that would want to serve that country. The issue here boils down to organizational culture as well and the practices of those with the powers uh, to deploy and hire within the public service. So I think it's a matter of mismanaged potential and mismanaged mm. the country. No, no, it's an interesting one, especially you, you use the word deployment. And as you know, there's still ongoing <laughs> court cases. Just on that, you know, while we touch on it, and, and I like the fact that you, you center the issue of our potential in the fact that there's human, you know, that the fact that the, the human capital of the country, I was actually speaking to a colleague of mine from the private sector, you know, he said something which, I look, I've been probably guilty of also saying it, where we say, look, South Africa's education system is, is falling apart. And then he said, look, take it, if we really had to, wait, and I like the way you put it, if we had to actually investigate, what, what do we mean by that? Because he said, listen, the weirdest thing is, if you are obviously a privileged South African who's able to go to the right, you know, primary high school, you go to the right universities, for some reason, the right, these right places in South Africa allow our skills to travel overseas. That's why if you go to London, Australia, South Africans are very much in high demand. So what you're saying is, uh, is our issue more public education, as in, let's be, you know, let's be more real, places where rural South Africa and sometimes township schools, which are struggling. Because you're right in saying that we do produce skills. It's just, like you said, how we orientate that. And then maybe just bring to the issue of, how, you know, how do we kind of work on that, where we can take the good we have and, Make sure that the, like you said, the system accommodates that. Because you're right in saying you can't just put people that are skilled and say go work and make miracles. What do you think actually needs to be done for for us to take this existing potential and actually make it work for government? I think firstly, let me touch on the first point, TK, about uh, the differences between public education and uh, private education systems in South Africa. I think South Africa is one of those countries that invest quite a lot. I think the last time I checked, it was what. Uh, 0 0.7 or 7 percent, I can't, I think 0 0.7 percent of the GDP in its education. I just have to verify that. I think it was, but it was quite significant yeah. to, 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 to global standard. So the issue has not necessarily been the resources that are actually invested in the education system, public education system to be quite precise. Uh, it is a matter of using the, those resources optimally. Mm -hmm. uh, to transform uh, our public education system. Uh, remember, money on its own, uh, and these are financial resources that have been invested, but financial resources on, on their own are not sufficient 
we need the right attitudes, as I've, I've said as well, and, and political will to transform our public uh, education system. So there's a lot there that the different stakeholders, government, labor, and even business to an extent, because mm -hmm. a funded public uh, education system ultimately benefits everyone in the economy. So it would be in the best interest of business as well to partake in ensuring that our public education system uh, it is fixed. And secondly, in terms of uh, producing the right kind of skills where South Africa actually exports uh, skills around the globe, it just proves my point that there's no challenge in terms of skills in South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's how those yeah. skills are produced. Um, and also, how does the government get to a place where it, it incentivizes skilled people to, you know, to come into, into, into the public service? And sometimes it's not about financial incentives. No. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, certain individuals thrive on leading a life of purpose. The fact that they could contribute to fixing the country, to them, that's enough reward. But I think there has to be some level, some level of assurance that once the skilled people come into the public service, uh, they'll be given space and room, yeah. and then environment improved for them to actually be able to play a role and or part in transforming the public service the way the government intends to. No, no, that, that, that's actually a very good point because it, it brings, yeah, because I think it kills, like you said, many of the, the fallacies which exist that, oh my word, things are so hopeless. You know, like I think what, what many people always touch on, which is, it makes sense in the analysis that, yes, we are on the African continent. We've seen this many times on the rest of the continent, but South Africa's problems are unique in that it's almost as though there's a stubbornness not to allow skills and those that can to get, to get into the public sector. And, Look, how, how do you think, is, did we start off well in this, in the sense that, uh, going back to the issue maybe of uh, the deployment of cadres, and I, and I just want to make a clarification, and I'll see if you agree or not, but from what I know, that there's a separation between being a cadre and a comrade. It's two different things. I think Owar Tambo used to say, you know, many are called to be comrades, very few are, are called to be cadres. But it would seem as though, you know, this term cadre has become quite a mess. And if you maybe could just maybe elaborate on, because I think we'd agree that every country, every government, including the one in the Western Cape, when they come into power, they'll want a level of comfort with the civil servants that they have. So, or is it simply, look, the issue of having cadres is a misnomer and we just need to get rid of that idea completely. Just your, your understanding in relation to what you've said about skills. Look, the tying that notion of skills and, and, and of cadership and, and, and comradeship, I think uh, South Africans have a challenge with losing or rather using certain concepts or terms loosely. Uh, comrade. In South Africa, essentially, you just pay your what, 20 rent mm -hmm. annual membership fee, then automatically you're a comrade. Mm -hmm. You have no understanding of party values, um, party objectives. It doesn't matter which political party it is, by the way. I mean, we have so many political parties in South Africa. I've, I've lost count, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, yeah, because I remember, I think, our local government elections were contested by over 200 parties, for Jeez. instance. Yeah, so, I mean, that's quite a lot of parties. But anyway, um, the idea here is that pay membership fee or annual membership fee, which is 10 rand, 20 rand, depends on the political party, whatever the amount is, it doesn't really matter, uh, should not necessarily warrant one a comrade. And mm. I'll take an example of the ruling party, for instance, or the governing party, uh, the African National Congress. Uh, the African National Congress is a mass party. And it, can, it, ha, it has no mechanisms in place uh, to actually ensure or vet the kind of people it recruits into the ranks, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, because it's a mass party and what has been referred to as a broad church, ideological orientation is not necessarily important in the agency. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they recruit, whatever it is, as long as you have your 20 rand, you're willing to join. 
they don't care about your ideological orientation. You are good to go, you are good to be a member, and that 20 rand filling in a form uh, makes you a, a comrade, which is something that I think is flawed in their, in their recruitment practices. In terms of the cater, a cater is someone who has ideological understanding, uh, ideologically grounded, they're politically disciplined, and they understand the objectives of the party, the reasons for the existence of that very party, and the mission that party has actually undertaken, which many in the ANC do not understand this. I think there's been very uh, a large number rather, of, of, of CADA parties across the globe. The issue about CADA parties, TK, is that in terms of electoral competition, they tend to not to fare well. Mm. So that's why CADA uh, parties end up in mass parties. Uh, one of the issues with the ANC here is that it, it equates a large membership to more mass appeal, if I make sense. Yeah. And for me, I've always argued that, I mean, Tabon Baker has been a proponent of this. Uh, fewer but better. And I think yeah. even the former president, uh, the late president Nelson Mandela, had actually touched on the issue. You remember that the first conference of the ANC uh, after the unbanning in 1990, I think it was uh, the 1994 conference, if I'm not mistaken, in his political report, uh, President Nelson Mandela already, already raised concerns about the caliber of people that the ANC recruited. Mm. Uh, something that has been ongoing for a while now, suddenly the ANC feels that uh, it's an urgent issue that they need to address. Not necessarily. I mean, as far back as 2012, Mangaung, uh, when Jacob Zuma was re-elected for the second term, they declared a decade of the cater, for instance. Yes, that's true. Yeah, uh, that was another realization that the caliber of members within the party uh, are something that uh, is something that needs to be addressed. But nothing concrete was put in place. They established a political school. I think it was headed by David Masondo, uh, the deputy minister of finance currently. What happened to that? The school was never properly resourced. Uh, it has actually to some sort of book club more than anything else. The book the club. Club. <laughs> you know, I, I don't mean any disrespect to book club, but I yeah. mean, for what the school was meant to achieve mm. and what it's currently engaging in now, yeah. Uh, so that was another thing. Uh, the programs or mechanism put in place to correct this have not yielded any, any desired results. Uh, so then, the poor quality of membership there's still also no mechanism to ensure from this pool of membership, how do we identify the ones that are actually capable of being in government? I know the Communist Party in China, for instance, they have what they call, is it the CADA list or the party list? I can't remember the name properly, but the list anyway is about a name of cadres that are capable and competent, learned people that have proven themselves yeah. uh, to serve in the public service. And it is from that list that people that are deployed in government are taken. The ANC has no such a mechanism. Whoever makes the loudest noise, whoever people seeing his name or her name the loudest gets deployed. I actually like what uh, the president of the EFF said, I think a week or so ago, uh, after they have just won or were appointed or given two seats for MMCs in the city of Jobek, he mm -hmm. said governance is something that is different. Just because you can sing the loudest, you can organize at party level, does not automatically mean that you are fit enough for purpose when it comes to government roles. He actually emphasized this idea that you cannot necessarily take a person with no skills. And I think in this instant, he used metric as an example. And you expect this person to actually go become an MMC 
in the city of Joburg. Remember the city of Joburg at some point was the eighth largest economy in the continent as a city. Mm -hmm. And now you want someone who does not have the necessary skills to be at the helm of governance in such a city. So the idea here is that we should, or rather the parties should separate organizational capabilities from administrative capabilities, and mm -hmm. which does not necessarily exist. Being a good political leader does not necessarily make one a good administrator. Uh, so the party has to develop some kind of mechanisms to deal with it, to separate those who are good for the party uh, from those who are good in administration. Yeah, no, no, uh, that's uh, that's actually a very good point because I'm also just remembering with the Chinese that, as you said, you start from local government, then to provincial. And like you said, it's always about proving and making sure. And I think that the key point which you touched on is ideology, you know, that uh, I think the Chinese have some of the, the head of ideology does not necessarily go into government. Uh, the, I think I'm, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, but I think the current head of the CCP's head of ideology is a proper ideologue, but they know that they can't put him in government, but they created a structure where he ensures that the party is moving in that direction. And look, uh, I guess maybe when you speak about the state of the nation, is there a South African ideology or are parties simply about whoever wins? Like uh, you mentioned the issue of, uh, I think the EFF and the rumblings that are happening in the city of Joburg, which I guess will spread to the city of Tswane, city of Ikoruleni, over time, just, yeah, and, and the, the way you put ideology, just on that, though, that I, I know people normally, the default position is the South African constitution, but I always say that that's not really something people have quite internalized, or and that's because I think it's overly liberal, but that's sort of, but just what is the ideology of this country? If, if like you're saying, even if, let's say you were not the most educated individual, and you get given the privilege of earning a high salary as a politician, why the need to almost uh, party over country? Is it that the country doesn't have an ideology that draws people or, or a party is very strong in their, in their mini ideology that, that almost usurps the country? Just on this issue of country, just linking it to the city of Joburg and this issue of coalition as an, is an ideology that it really is driving South Africa or, do, or are we basically a regionally, as you said, over 200 parties where everybody gets to pick what they want? So, yeah, just on that. Sorry for the, it's a, it's a, it's a combust question. <laughs> yeah, but on that, TK, in terms of, I think uh, the last point you made, you know, giving an example about uh, the array of parties. I remember that democracy is good, but people tend to forget that democracy has its limitations as well. Mm. And the plurality of thought and views and positions, it's a good thing but when not well managed can pose a challenge. Uh, in fact, I believe South Africa is at a stage of political fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And political fragmentation is one of the side effects, if I may say, of democracy. In terms of South Africa having an ideology, I do not necessarily think South Africa has an ideology. Uh, anyway, I'm not... I'm not one to support a country to have a specific ideology. I think ideological dogmatism does not necessarily serve a purpose. I think we as a society, we should, as a country, we should be very pragmatic in our approach. Mm -hmm. um, certain things viewed from certain uh, ideological perspectives make sense. Uh, certain other things from other ideological perspectives make sense. So it's not necessarily about this ideological dogmatism, but pragmatism that gets things done and gets things done right. The best possible solution at any given point. For mm -hmm. me, that's how we should approach, uh, approach things as, as, as South Africans. And by the very virtue of being, or rather our, our, our constitution being anchored in liberal values, uh, we automatically open up space for diversity. <laughs> so whether they have views and thoughts, and the fact that our constitution is anchored in those liberal values, it actually accepts and tolerates uh, ideological differences. And uh, for me, that's good, but that tends to lead, as I said, to pol political fragmentation, which when not managed well, then it poses a challenge. 
I mean, we spoke about the city of Joburg earlier. Uh, the city of Joburg, I think it has over 15 parties represented in council, if I'm not mistaken, or so. That is a clear sign of political fragmentation. But those okay. number of parties were elected by people. It means the wishes of the electorate are that council should be constituted by different political parties. But that fragmentation now tends to impact stability within the city of Joburg, and not only the city of Joburg, because we see it across yeah. various yeah. And municipalities, by the way, in the country. Uh, political instability. Sometimes budgets go for weeks and even months without being passed. And remember that services cannot be offered without budget being passed. That's the first thing. Mm. Uh, once budgets are passed, three months later, there's a vote of no confidence on, in the mayor, whoever the mayor is at that time. Uh, and that will ultimately impact uh, the level of service provision. Not necessarily that even when there's a, a single party in government in those municipalities, we tend to see proper optimal levels of services, but coalition governments just tend to make things worse. And coalition governments are as a result of political fragmentation, which is what not, when it's not well managed, we have what we have. So those are some of the, terms, you know, the side effects of, of democracy, for lack of a better word. Yeah. But just Matala, on this issue of political fragment, uh, fragmentation, as you, as you call it, so what, how long can it go on without it eventually crippling a state? And I say this in relation to at the moment, we, like you're saying, we're seeing it at local government, uh, but next year, 2024, could possibly be national. And there's certain services or line budget items, which for now have been good because national kind of runs them. So how long can this happen? And when, when does it almost, uh, what comes after political fragmentation? Is it like three eventual things happen, four eventual things happen? But if you could just talk us through, just then understand, okay, we're in it. It's not like you can't go out of it. But what does it look like if it continues in this, in this pattern? And uh, what does it mean if you, now you almost put this into the national and eventually the international because South Africa does have uh, SADC responsibilities and is supposed to be still um, a major large player on the, on the continent. So what does this look like and how does it, what does the end look like? I always like things when there's a beginning, a middle and an end. <laughs> Tiga, for me, it's a matter of managing it. Um, I think political fragmentation uh, is what transpires in the Netherlands. Uh, the concept of Dutchification uh, of politics because you know, coalition governments are commonplace there. I'm not sure whether it's Poland or what. Um, I think last week, uh, since 2021 elections, they have not been able to form a government. Parliament has been dissolved, I think, for the third time now since 2021 elections, uh, last week. I'll just have to make sure, but I think it's Poland. I, I you know, I, I was perusing through uh, normal political stories from across the globe. Then I came across it, I, I, I perused it through the story. But those are some of the results of political fragmentation. Imagine a country not having a proper government for two years. What does that spell? Uh, we're not talking about a local government authority here, but we're talking a national government. I do not necessarily think political fragmentation is the issue. Hmm. But the ability of political parties to approach, manage, and handle it, that's the concern. Are South African political parties mature enough to understand what is at stake uh, in terms of getting the government to function, the public service to function, uh, whether it's at local government level or at national level? Because remember, we have two separate public services in South Africa, something that... Uh, I, I still cannot make sense of. Yeah, that's what. That's why one of the things that governments intend is to have unification of the public service, to have a single public service. Because what happens at the local government level and what happens at national and provincial is two different, separate public mm -hmm. services. Uh, so how that is handled in terms of the parties to handle this? Uh, 
diversity of thoughts, diversity of perspectives, uh, in whether it's councils, whether it's in provincial legislatures, whether it's at parliament. I think that counts more. And political parties over the past few years have somewhat indicated that they do not necessarily care about the well-being of South Africans, but rather about their own power interests within those kind of settings. And I think that is where now we as voters as well, I mean, I'm a voter, I might, I might, you know, sometimes when people see you comment on these issues, give input, sometimes they do tend to forget that you are a member of society, you are yeah. a South African, and you are a voter as well, and you are impacted about by the very same things that you comment on on a daily. Uh, and I think we as voters, we have a responsibility to assess our choices. And more than that, though, I think we have a responsibility to cultivate a culture of an active citizenship. Because ultimately, it is that that can hold a government. It doesn't matter who the governing party is, mm. but it is that culture that can lead to cultivating a culture of accountability. And once we have that, I do not necessarily think that some of the challenges we have with our different governments will persist. Because I remember South Africans post 94, they developed this concept that the government will provide. The government mm -hmm. will do most of the stuff. Hence, if you notice, the culture of civil society, I think, was weakened in South Africa post-94. Uh, we saw, I think, in the late 1990s, early 2000 again, where civil society started gaining momentum. And I think the best example of this is the treat, uh, treatment action campaign, how we took the whole provision of ARVs by the government forward. I think that was when the culture of civil society was reignited in South Africa and posted uh, a lot of people have learned from that kind of activism from TAC and actually started to rebuild that culture of civil society because they had realized that maybe the government of the day uh, has forgotten its promises to the people and mm -hmm. people through civil society ought to hold it accountable. And until we cultivate that proper active citizenship, uh, the culture of that in South Africa, we're going to have some of those challenges. And I think that is one of the things that can help us mitigate the impacts of political fragmentation. Uh, it's weird when you say the, the, I think there are two notions of active citizenship, which I think is a very positive in civil society. When you say civil society, I'm reminded of Robert Mugabe, who used to say, Within civil society, they're quite uncivil in how they do things. And in the, in the sense that, uh, and it's good that you juxtapose it with the active, that sometimes we're seeing a lot of civil societies, you know, the issue of funding and the basis of them. And I think maybe where the governing party has been correct, uh, correct. It's always highlight the fact that if you look at people in civil society, you always question, do they really come from the communities they claim to represent? I mean, you're right in saying the TAC, by virtue of HIV and AIDS, even now, it's still a big problem, but I think the issue of antivirals have been handled a lot better by the government. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those notions, uh, it's almost a, it threatens the whole of the state. But we, we're starting to see, you know, in little places, especially for when I go to Northwest, you know, certain places, Bomahike, Rustenburg. And, and I think what you're right in saying, what's missing is almost the graduation of active citizenry where people in their own locations start to take the, you know, the state, I think they become more responsible for what they want to see. Then, I, yeah, because sometimes one has a bit of a discomfort with uh, civil society, as Mugabe had raised, that they become quite uncivilized when you kind of look deeper into how they function. So, no, so I think it, it's a point, it's a, it's a good point there. Eh? Yeah, but I mean, that, that would understand why you and many others would be uncomfortable with the notion of civil society. I mean, uh, civil societies uh, have been hijacked of late by those who advance narrow interest. But civil society organizations, by their very nature, I think they represent narrow interest. 
Hmm. And by virtue of them being able to attract huge resources and mostly financial resources and human capital as well, they tend to influence public policy. Hmm. And at times they influence it with no much resistance from, from other sectors of society. Because of this, and remember that they represent narrow interest, uh, sometimes they pose a threat uh, to interests that are beneficial to the wider society. Uh, I mean, above their own narrow agendas. And I think it is for those very reasons that why sometimes uh, the concept of civil society is frowned upon uh, because of the resources, uh, whether financial or human capital, and the ability to provide this kind of assistance, technical skill assistance, financial assistance to governments. And as such, they do tend to pose a, 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 a threat. I mean, we have what we call elitism of sorts in, 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 in South Africa. Yes, we have a democracy, but our democracy typically happens from an elitist perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, people claim to represent the working class. At the end of the day, those people that claim to represent the working class are elites as well, because they're part of the political elites. That's true, yeah. And to be quite honest, most of the decisions are made by the elites. Uh, so this elitism in South Africa is very difficult to escape. Hence, I'll always advocate for this active citizenry from South Africans. Mm -hmm. The ones who do not have the resources, who do not have the money to buy media time or ads to influence how society thinks, how society views certain things, they do not have the resources to commission research, all of those things. The only resources that they have is the numbers that they carry as ordinary members of society. And I think they should use that to the advantage, something that most civil society organizations do not necessarily have. I mean, we've had issues with protests in South Africa. A lot of people have bemoaned protests of infringing, you know, various rights of people and whatnot. But I always ask this question. When this concerned people, the only resource that they have at their disposal is the numbers. Why aren't they allowed to use those numbers? Yes, I understand the rules and people should protest in a certain legal framework, whatnot. Hmm. But I believe this protest uh, are the last line of defense for those who do not have the financial resources and the technical expertise compared to other sections of society. I mean, business has those. We know that for a fact. Yeah. Labor has those. You know, the labor claims that they represent the working class, but there's money in labor, labor movements. Everybody knows that. I mean, uh, we hear stories about investment arms in labor unions, whatnot. There's yeah. money. They have the resources to access uh, top-notch research, top-notch views around certain issues, whatnot. But the people, ordinary people, the only thing they have is the numbers. And they mm -hmm. should organize themselves around that and use that to, that, uh, to the advantage. Hence, I advocate for this active citizenship, or citizen rather. Yeah, it sounds a bit like uh, Marx in the dust when he speaks about the only thing that labor has at the end is just the bodies they have and they have the ability to use it. So you're right, in the South African sense where I guess unemployment is very high. Your numbers then become your capital from which you can use it. But no, it's an interesting point that you raise there, Matala, because it kind of always leads us to, because I think we've done a wraparound of uh, the local. We touched on the national and what 2024 could look like and also the construction of the state. But that other question, which sometimes I always feel goes a bit missing in this discussion is, uh, South Africa's regional role. Now, look, I, I always say uh, we're not. I don't advocate for South Africa being the United States of Africa, but I do advocate for South Africa learning to use its power to ensure that listen, certain partners in the region are not a negative on uh, our public infrastructure. 
just how you think they would view it. Because at the end of the day, South Africa is large not because I don't think in the ANC's mindset it it had always envisioned itself being look the, the big the only big player in town. It had hoped that Zani would come to the party, that the MPLA, uh, Frelimo, and the like would also grow the economies, but. What, what does it mean for a fragmented South Africa? What does that mean for SEDEC? Because uh, surely they are also looking, and they also have their interests within South Africa. I mean, we cannot lie, ZANU has a lot of interests within South Africa. Uh, yeah, so just on that, what do you think it looks like for them as they look at the state of South Africa and the fragmentation you speak of? I think firstly, it would be unwise not to acknowledge uh, the waning influence of South Africa in the region whether in South Africa or in the continent. Uh, I'll, you know, firstly, I'll, I'll point out this. We always complain about lack of state capacity, right? In the public yeah. service. But somehow we expect to miraculously have this intensified influence in the region. Uh, there's foreign policy issues, number one. I think many guys, you know, people in the academy have written and assessed our foreign policy. They've pointed out weaknesses in the foreign policy and they've pointed out the need to rejig our foreign policy, for instance. That's just another aspect. This foreign policy of ours is implemented and affected by people in the public service. Yeah. The very public service, we say that it's not capacitated enough, does not have the capabilities. But somehow, miraculously, we expect now, when we send these people to go communicate our national interests uh, you know, across our borders, to suddenly have the competences, the capabilities to do it excellently. Uh, we have various missions across, across the globe, and even in the African continent. We place people who are members of the public service. For instance, the people that are at our, our missions uh, across people from the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, uh, some from the DTIC, some from Home Affairs, various you know, government departments. We complain about these departments not having the necessary capabilities the people that are taken, drawn from that pool of people that we say do not have capabilities. But when we send them outside of the country to go represent us, whether at multilateral platforms or at missions, whatever it is, we suddenly expect them to have capabilities mm -hmm. uh, to keep South Africa's influence. By the way, acting on a foreign policy that we say needs to be rejected, is confused. So put mm -hmm. that foreign policy with the very people that lack capabilities and a political leadership that is not necessarily leadership as well. So it's a cocktail for disaster when you put all these three elements together. Um, unfortunately, South Africa, I would say it is a, its lowest in the region in terms of the influence. But what saves South Africa and what gives South Africans a false sense of exceptionalism is the fact that governance and capabilities of countries in the regions are declining as well. Mm. <laughs> but if had all the necessary indicators, governance indicators, uh, the right political leadership, for instance, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia. Uh, I don't like to speak much about Swaziland because it tends to be a non-factor. In, in Mozambique, for instance, the countries that surround South Africa, let's just speak SADC for now, mm -hmm. and has been correct in those. Uh, I do honestly believe that South Africa's capabilities would be overshadowed. What saves South Africa currently is, is still better than Zimbabwe. It's still better than Mozambique. It's still better than Swaziland. Do you understand? We are not saying mm. far exits. We say it is still better. We acknowledge that our position is declining. But it's almost like a. Oh, sorry. I'm saying it's almost like a race to the bottom. 
Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead. Again. Yeah. So, so it raises then the question of if if South Africa fails, and I, again looking at the invest, I mean South African companies, I mean they quite, which is an oddity. They invested, but they're not such sometimes the biggest investors in those countries because I think the Chinese, uh, I think the they're larger in size. Well, well, it's China, so it's always bigger. Just a question of if, you know, and I know you also do some scenario planning, if this continued to decline due to political fragmentation and, like you said, the lack of leadership happens, where do South Africans run to? As in, you know, it's always been the case that Zimbabweans and other, players, and other members of SEDEC can come to South Africa, which does create its own issues among South African communities. So I think the majority of South Africans, the skilled ones, such as yourself, you guys could go to Australia, you could go to the UK, you can go to the US. But in mass, where do South Africans go if it collapses? Because um, Botswana is very strict. It doesn't allow people. They don't really, you know how Botswana is. Botswana is one of those few countries where they actually do try to abide by their laws in terms of who they allow in and who they give citizenship. But just a broader question of a collapse of South, South Africa, if it goes further than this. Where do South Africans go to if the region is already, one might say, problematic owing to lack of uh, good governance and the like? I think only South Africans are in a position to answer that. Uh, I mean, to be quite honest, TK, that is a very difficult one for me. <laughs> I, would, I would think that only South Africans are capable of answering that. If they do not take, as I indicated earlier, uh, cultivate this culture of ex active citizenry. But mm. what are they? Do you understand? Uh, this is my country that must take ownership of it. Um, mm. and, and then to set the record straight, TK, I don't think I'm going anywhere, by the way. <laughs> no, 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 I'm okay in South Africa. I'm not happy with the way things are, but I would, I would rather remain part of the people that would contribute into uh, fix in South Africa, uh, if needs be. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. But on that, Matlal, if I could just quiz you, because, uh, I'm, you know, it used to be one of those taboo subjects that if you ask an African, South African, are you leaving? Then, you know, we give a reaction like, why would I leave? We'd expect it from, you know, other races in South Africa to be. But it's now becoming more common, especially amongst the, the African population of South Africa, to say, it's not bad to go overseas. I can always come back and be buried here. But my kids, you know, that's the thing now. My kids, you want your kids to live in a better place. Just so for you, I mean, obviously, you know, you're not, you and I are not a total representation of uh, of the. I think we're a minority. I'm Tswana, you're Tswana. With pettiness, we're we're quite the minority. I know. But just on that, I mean, what do you think it'll? How long before people, especially the 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 skilled black middle class, start to say enough? Is enough. I'm leaving. As in, what 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 breaks them? Because they're used to suffering. It's they're used to discrimination. But there's always a thing that things like you say things can get better at home. That next step where they say enough is enough. What do you think? What will it take for them to say enough is enough? I'm leaving. Because you've just said, Yogi, look, I'd rather stay here. But he, I know you've got friends who are at that position. Just take us into that conversation a bit. I think our breaking points as people are different, TK. Some people have had enough as it is. They have they have decided to go uh, look for greener pastures elsewhere. Uh, some are continuing to do it. Um, and remember, most of the time, as you say, the skilled people, whatever, it is typically the middle class that has uh, this advantage and privilege of always opting to leave the country when 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 things don't work out. Uh, I think our breaking points ultimately remain remain different, but also the, uh, the opportunities presented to us and the resources to access those opportunities. All of these things are determining factors in terms of when people feel it will be time for them to leave. No, no, that's a, that's a good one. I'll take you up on, I think, for the last 10 minutes we have just, you said something about being here, being an active citizen, actually helping, you know, getting through story in the country. So scenario where you've just been brought in by the president, he's not making you the new minister of 
is it energy or electricity or, or a very weird <laughs> it's a very weird you know our president comes up with weird things but yeah so basically he, you're an advisor right he says listen Matara, looked at your work looked at your experience and I know it's, it's, one, it's one of those things they always ask uh, people who commentate, give us five things to fix the country. With. But, you know, things w- which you have looked at within your scope of work, which you're saying, listen, I think if we were to at least try to fix some of these things, President, focusing our energy and resources on this, you can try to get some dividend from it. W- what would you advise as to say, look, where should you be looking to try to get some, not fixing everything, like you say, you don't fix everything overnight and you don't fix, you can't promise people that you'll fix everything going to 2024. It just doesn't, policy-wise, it doesn't make sense. But what what leverage points, where, where should he his focus or this government's focus be? Just two or three I, things which you, you, you have in mind. And you know, TK, that approach is something that actually asks me quite a lot. Because they will say, you know, you know things that we can fix quickly for quick wins, low-hanging fruits. Yeah. That is the approach. They go for low-hanging fruits, but the anchoring challenges are never addressed. Year after year, it's always the low-hanging fruits. Uh, the fundamental challenges are always pushed back. We'll see it later. Let's go for the low-hanging fruits. And during that period, the fundamental problems get aggravated. Yep. And years later, it becomes difficult to deal with or address. TK. I'll be very honest with you. For me, it's not as simple as that, but uh, President Ramaphosa spoke about hope and resilience in the, in the State of the Nation address. Uh, number one, we should look at long-term efforts. Public sector capabilities. For me, that's that. Mm. Uh, let's stop throwing many plans, coming up with many regulations. We have what we call the National Development Plan. Whether it's a plan or not, I mean, the question remains. But let's now develop implementation plan, uh, plans rather, and monitoring and evaluation mechanisms for the implementations of the plans that we have in place. Uh, so essentially, public service capabilities to implement the plans we already have in place. Mm-hmm. Monitor those. I mean, uh, if we implement the, some of the plans we have in place, the thing is about public policy, we'll never get 100% the results. Yeah. But a badly implemented policy is better than a policy that's not implemented at all. It will yeah, yield yeah. certain results. On top of that, let's look at our education policy. Uh, industrial policy and labor market policies. Let's align this. Year in, year out, we hear that we have a skills mismatch in South Africa. People are getting educated in the wrong fields, but I'm glad that during the sauna, the president mentioned something, I think about 800 million, if I'm not mistaken, from the skills fund. Uh, that will train people towards certain skills that are needed. But for me, that's a stopgap measure. Mm -hmm. It's no different from GIPSA. Mm -hmm. The same same thing happened back then where they had to get skills quickly. A stopgap measure like GIPSA was introduced. But in long-term thinking, then what? If you look at the mid-term strategic framework, government had proposed uh, to develop a skills skills portal, not a portal. I forgot what the proper name is, but it's there in the midterm strategic framework 2019 to 2024. Essentially to ensure that South Africa produces the skills that the economy requires. Mm -hmm. Align the industrial policy with those uh, education policy or skills development policies. This is what we want to achieve industrial policy-wise, but what would it take for us as a country to achieve these things that we've set up? This is the kind of skills we're going to need. In year one, we're roughly going to need so many people from these different backgrounds, year two, year three, year whatever. Align that skills development policy and education policy 
with what you hope to do. Rejig the, the labor, labor policies to be in tangent with the skills development policy and industrial policy. Remember ultimately, poverty, unemployment, inequality, those remain the biggest challenges in South Africa. When you eradicate this one, unemployment, you simultaneously address poverty yeah. and inequalities. So focus on creating jobs. But for you to focus to, to generate jobs or create jobs, you'll need a public service that functions. Remember, you need to provide infrastructure. That's yeah. where the public, a functioning public service comes in. So do these things simultaneously. Some of the things does not have to be low hanging fruit. We've had issues with an incapable public service. I think the National Development Plan is from our 2012. It's 2023 now. We've had the National Development Plan for over 10 years. The issue of a capable state was raised there. It's been more than 10 years. What have we had? If we had focused on that 10 years ago, where would we be now as a country, as a society, with a capable public service? Remember, sometimes a capable public service does not only uh, hinder performance in terms of implementing policies, but the conceptualization of policies, the yeah, framing of policies, the development of policies, how you see things, uh, be very different if had we implemented that from the 10 years ago that we adopted the National Development Plan. A plan that's not necessarily a plan. And one of the things is because there's no implementation strategies and implementation frameworks in the National Development Plan. That's why we see it with a document with little to show for it. In the local government, we used to call it a door stopper. It's big enough to stop the door from sliding. But yeah, it's, no, it's, it's actually quite interesting then, Matal, because I think I love the way you were able to actually touch on industrial education and the big challenges of unemployment, inequality, you know, and poverty. Because sometimes you're right in saying, uh, I think we talk in, in folk tongues about many things missing, that these are the crucial things, and this is a role of policy. And uh, I have to say, the, I enjoy the discussion, especially your linkages to policy. Because uh, look, uh, I think one of the reasons we have shows like this and we bring people like you in is, I think South Africans like, and then sometimes the media is guilty. They like to talk about the talk, but no one likes speaking about policy because policy, you, you would know, people find policy very boring. It is long-term by its nature. It forces you to, to think, to make, uh, look, you, like, I like what you said, there is no such thing as perfect policy, but there's better, it's better to have a policy which is implemented so you can see what the imperfections are. So I uh, no, really did enjoy the way you were able to link that there. And maybe we can even, you know, maybe advertise for you to be the minister of fixing things. If you can have a minister of electricity, I'm sure the next step is to have a minister in the presidency to fix things. You know, you, you remind me of something that I saw, I think a few days ago, a day after the sauna. When you say, when they said, when you are the minister of finance, but the president appoints the minister of money. So that's what <laughs> <laughs> With and then the Minister of Electricity. So yeah, and I don't know what the thinking is with, with, with the Minister of, you know, that kind, those kind of, it's a new department created essentially. Uh, but the weirdness of it, though, Matala, of, uh, it, remember uh, uh, President Becky was accused of centralizing power within the presidency. And, but his was a, I guess it depends who, how you see it. Boy, he was quite big on having skills within it. But I think his was more, he had grand policy the, the, or the taking instrumentality of policy. Our president is, the current one seems to be almost creating a mini government within the presidency, if you look at it, which is the, the oddity of it is, yeah. And you know what's the funny bit, TK? People accuse President Beke of, of, of centralizing power within, within the president. I think the issue there was that it was not a matter of bloating the presidency with uh, former President Tabombeke. It was establishing certain capabilities within the presidency. Mm. Uh, after he left office, uh, I think the staff component in the president the more than doubled under the pres uh, under President Zuma. That's the funniest bit. Mm. While people talk about a bloated president presidency during uh, former President Tabombeke, and I think one of the things that uh, you know, he was accused of having the super presidency. It was because of the um, 
PCAS, the Policy Coordinating Advisory Services, what is usually known as, 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 as the policy unit. Because it has so much, uh, such powers uh, that almost even controlled how budgets would be affected uh, at some point. Uh, and that was the challenge, but not necessarily that it was bloated and it was effective. That was mm-hmm. policy coordination in South Africa. Government departments, you know, sang in one tune. Uh, everybody was clear what was needed. Uh, what is the policy direction within government? Currently, now we don't have that. I mean, let's take the energy insecurity crisis, for instance. How many people in the ANC have spoken about it? And the varying mm-hmm. views. <laughs> on on the energy crisis, how to solve it. I mean, look, I do not have anything against the Secretary General of the ANC, who happens to be the current Minister of Transport. But he should not necessarily be leading discussions on how to, uh, how to address the energy crisis in South Africa. You have the ANC Secretary General, the Minister of Transport speaking on it. You have NEC members uh, giving their own input, different NEC members. You have the Department of Minerals and Energy Resources, uh, uh, Guete, speaking on the issue. I think you have about 30 people or so speaking on the issue and not necessarily in sync. Yeah. Sometimes actually opposing each other. That is the worst example, or rather the best example of policy incoherence and policy uncertainty. I mean, we just came, or rather the ANC just came, 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 came from conference two months ago, but already they are speaking in different directions on a policy issue. So that should ring alarm bells for, for investors as well. And those are some of the things that I believe the governing party could avoid uh, to create some level of stability within within the country because policy uncertainty is one of the dangers when it comes to attracting investments in the country. Yeah. Besides the fact that energy crisis, energy itself is a big factor. Now the policy uncertainty is around the energy. Uh, it's a cocktail for disaster, TK. Yeah, no, and, it, uh, and I think it points to I think a point you raised that I know we've been looking at state capacity, uh, especially at a policy level, because I think you've explained it quite well. But there's also thinking of at the moment. I know Joel Nitatenze is out of the NEC, and look, Joel's be, he was part of that uh, policy unit you speak of, PCAS, and it does really make you think now who is the ANC's policy czar? Uh, I know uh, Joel's influence had waned over time, but. The big question to ask is, like you said now, I mean, the general secretary is the engine, not necessarily, it's not meant to be a position of, of ideology and policy. It's more the orientation and how you organize discussions around that. So it does make you think who is now the ANC's head of, who's the policies are of the ANC? Because I think the DA actually experiences, I'm, I'm not sure if you remember an individual, I think it was Campbell. He, he used to be in the DA, but I think moved to the UK to even join the, I think it wasn't the Conservative Party, it was the other, it was a Liberal Democrat Party, but every party does have its head of policy. So at the moment, you're right that it's a bit worrying that they're in, or is there, or do they have a new Joel Newton tender that maybe we don't know about at the moment? Not that I'm aware of TK as well. And, and I think TK, to be quite honest, Sometimes it's not necessarily about having that leading thinker who's the head of policy or the policy within the party. I think it's about bringing together policy thinkers, Mm. creating an environment for them and say, look, uh, we require expertise on the certain issues. And remember, policy thinkers and policy makers and whatever, uh, scholars as well, are not necessarily experts in everything. Uh, you have people who are public policy specialists but in health, some in energy, some in education. Just because you are you know, 
a public policy specialist does not mean that you understand or rather you are an expert yeah. across all the fields. So you bring these people from different, all these different backgrounds and say, look, uh, this is a platform for you uh, set up for you to help the party uh, generate ideas on how to solve some of the challenges. And that also gives us element of diversity. I think diversity is very important, especially uh, for what we call wicked problems, uh, issues such as poverty. Uh, poverty is something that is hardly eradicated. Uh, poverty is resolved. It goes up and down depending on various variables and factors at any given point in time. Uh, it impacts health, it impacts education, you know, a lot of things. Uh, and it's good to have people of different thoughts when you deal with certain issues to test some of uh, your thesis, your thinking, to say, but you're looking at it from that perspective and you've ignored this. Unlike just having a single person who dominates policy. Uh, so I think they should co you know, concentrate on opening up a unit more than relying on individuals. Mm -hmm. Formalize this you know, policy capacity within the party. No, no, that's actually a great, great idea, Damatla. Yeah, because you're right in saying it's, you, there's no longer the, the dominance of one individual. There's not, yeah, very few people know it all. And I think like complexity of problems, yeah, that's that. Matan, uh, I know you're forever a busy man. Uh, I think the last few things we'll ask is, what can people expect from you this year? Anything you're working on of interest uh, that we should keep an eye out on? Uh, where can we uh, get hold of you if we want you to come to our policy? And if the president is looking for a minister of, of fixing things? Yeah, so if you could just uh, close us off with that. <laughs> Firstly, I think uh, my availability for 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 the president or the government for minister of anything, I think I will I will, I will, I will, I will rather pass on that. The next thing you'll find a minister of potholes, TK. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather pass on that. So, but TK, I'm 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 currently at the Vest School of Governance. Um, I'm very easy to get hold of in terms of that's my, that's academic, my, my academic home. Uh, I teach public policy there. Yeah, uh, something that I enjoy very much. I mean, I speak public policy because that's what I do. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't written in a while in terms of opinion pieces, TK. I think this year that's something that um, the people can expect more. Uh, yeah, but my writing is always anchored around policy issues. I do not necessarily want to write about occurrences, who said what about who, no, that's that's what we defeat the purpose. And I think we have a lot of people already writing about that. So we need to inform uh, and educate South Africans and exchange ideas with them in general terms. That's why I would rather contribute to the public discourse through some form of policy writing, whether it's opinion pieces, but the subjects must be anchored in policy and policy thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm planning to do in the air. And remain in obscurity for a while while I push uh, academic publications, nothing more, TK. No, uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, I think really, look, uh, as I said, one of the as I said, most, one of the most informed people. And what I enjoy most about Matala, context, he always seem, seems to have his uh, finger on understanding the context of policy in relation to real-world problems. So, uh, Matala, thank you so much for your time. Uh, hoping to, to have you again. And, yeah, now that you've declined the offer of being the Minister of Potholes or Fixing Things, I think we will have more of your time going forward. But thank you for the discussion, really informative. And look, uh, looking to have more of these types of discussions in 2023 with people such as Mr. Matala Sitofile and others who, as I said, the issue is not so much to the lament, as I think Matala really did actively put it, not lament the problems we have, but also think about, you know, key, key issues. And I, from this discussion today, the key things I took about, and I think it's very weird how he's put it quite ne neatly. So it's about statecraft, you know, and not just statecraft, but the issue of how do you actually get citizens to own 
part and parcel of the statecraft because I think that's really been the key thing which has been missing in South Africa. So Matrala, thank you so much. And hopefully you will become a regular guest on the show. And yeah, all, all the best for the year. And uh, we enjoy your hibernation. No, thank you. Thank you, TK. And thanks for having me. I'm very privileged, as I said earlier, to be the first guest for the TK Show 2023. Thanks, man. And yeah. anytime, my door is always open, TK. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and rate us on all your preferred podcast platforms. If you'd like to find out more about what we're doing, please join our Substack community via the link in the comments below. And as always, we'd love to hear your suggestions for future guests and conversation topics.